We got there. We landed at night. Um, I typically that's what we do. We leave the MTC really, really early in the morning, and then get to Korea pretty late at night. And so we couldn't see anything except uh, like the city lights. It's right on um, the coast, and there's a river right there. So coming in on that, it was kind of surreal because it was just super dark except lights everywhere, and it just was a really interesting kind of experience not being able to see anything. But like being in Korea, it was really surreal. It was just a super special feeling, just getting there, knowing that I was there, um, but still I couldn't see anything. So it was like, um, to me, it's kind of like stepping into the mission field literally, or I guess figuratively, and just being completely in the dark. Like you're still there, and you're still expected to be a missionary, but you don't have any experience yet, and that's okay. Like you can't expect yourself to see as well in the dark as you can in the day. And so when you first get, especially to Korea, um, it's okay to realize that you're not going to be as good as you want to be, or even as the people around you are. You're just, you're in the dark, really. But it's still a beautiful thing. It's still really pretty. So that was like landing and then driving to the mission home. And then the very first, so we had a meeting, I don't know, you know every mission president's different, so I don't know how they do it. But um, we had a meeting, and then the second night we were there, we went out and we proselyted uh, with the group of trainers that was there to train us. So we didn't know who our trainer was, but we went with a few different people. And we proselyted on the subway. We proselyted um, that time at a university. And it was amazing. So you still don't know Korean super well when you get there, obviously. but. I don't know, you just can't like describe in words the first time as um, you know, set apart dis like a set apart representative of the church and of Christ just talking to whoever's next to you. Like the best that you can. Again, you're in the dark, you don't really speak the language super well. And even if you do, um, you're not super used to missionary work. Mm, it just can't really be captured. You can't relive it ever. And so it's really, I think, just important to go in with like your whole heart and just talk to people and just love people around you. The Korean people were super nice. They like, I, they clearly didn't understand anything that I was saying. Having trained after that and knowing what my, train, my trainee was saying, they didn't understand anything I was saying uh, for the most part, but they could understand the basic words and they could understand what I was doing there. The name tag says a lot. Um, the way you dress says a lot. The way that uh, you smile at them says a lot. And they were just really nice. Just really loving people. Twice the monsoon. We didn't know it was coming because we don't watch the news and so we got caught outside in it. And literally we had umbrellas but we got soaked from the chest down like like soaked. And our we, we broke like three umbrellas that night. And the next day coming out after the storm blew over there were literally like dozens of just destroyed umbrellas all over the street from people that had got caught outside and then the other was just it was like it was beyond hot but and sweaty and you just like going out all day so but the monsoon was definitely the worst talking with anybody about anything was kind of because i was super um I was so shy, I really didn't like order pizza because I'd have to talk to somebody on the phone. Um, but I was able to talk to anybody about anything really. Um, and then cooking Korean food. I got pretty good at that, so that was good. There's a soup called Senji Gukbap, and it is uh, basically cow blood that's been like uh, boiled in a bag, so it's kind of like um, kind of a mix between chalk and jello. Kind of. I really like it. That's one of my favorite dishes. Um, dog soup is something that's pretty prevalent still there among like the older generation. I actually really, really love that dog. It's just like um, dogs raised up for food. That's really good. The other kind of really strange one that a lot of people see is live octopus. And you just kind of put a chopstick down and they'll wrap their tentacles around that and you roll it in sesame oil so it goes down easier. And then you just kind of like suck it off the chopstick and uh, it goes down. So that's really, I haven't got that one, that one's kind of expensive, so maybe next summer when I go back. The other one is uh, sea squirt, and that's like, they're really crazy to see, I don't know. 
Um, it's called Munge. Um, but it's like really interesting. They just like cut it open and then pull it out. It's kind of like an oyster, like, you know, the muscle kind of looking thing inside. And I was on the street one time and I, I had seen it, but I didn't know what it was. My brother who served in Korea characterized it um, as a not so tasty food dish. In any case, I didn't know what it was. I asked the guy what it was and he's like, oh, you've never had it before? And like pulled one out of the seawater, like cut it open, put it in my hand and made me eat it right there. And that was kind of intense. The taste was there for a long time. And we were like in the middle of a proselyting activity. So that was pretty miserable. But when they actually prepared well, those taste really good. I don't know how to characterize it. It's like a really strange looking thing. And then you like cut open the, um, the outside, I guess it's like an exoskeleton. And it looks like, you know, like the oyster thing, the part of the oyster that you eat. Yeah, it's like that inside. And you take that out and dip it in sauce usually and eat it. Usually you wash it and then dip it in like a cocktail sauce and eat it. You still eat it raw, but if you don't wash it, it tastes like a mouthful of seawater, so. And just not being able to speak Korean. Um, not being able to express myself and learning that uh, God's the one in charge and he's the one teaching the people. Spiritual experience, just finding people that the Lord had prepared in very, very strange ways, just like meeting somebody who led us to another person who is very prepared. Bring a coat. Um, it gets really cold, but like ties, shirts and stuff, you can find pretty cheap over there. Shoes are really hard to find for men with normal size feet and women with um, normal size western feet. Come up with a schedule for yourself and stick to it. Learn, use the discipline you learned and really, really, really develop discipline. Otherwise things get really difficult. Korea Busan is a super special place. It's the birthplace of the church in Korea. The first um, meeting place ever built in Korea was built there. The first stake, the first um, church held there was there. When the, um, during the Korean War, when the U.S. servicemen um, and other nation servicemen were over there, um, they didn't proselyte, but they held meetings there, and that's where the church started, was in Busan. So one of my areas was where the Book of Mormon was translated for the first time into Korean by um, a missionary. We have the first stake, the first ward there. Um, the first stake building is still there. I served there in Sujang. Um, the church history there is just beautiful, just super rich. Um, I mean, the headquarters is now in Seoul, but it, the church was born in Korea, in Busan. Church-wise, there's three stakes there now. Um, I think there's two districts. It's Really, there's some really big cities there, like Busan is obviously in the Busan Mission, Taejeon is in the Busan Mission, um, Changwon is another really big city. Um, we have Jeju-do, which is like the, um, the Korean paradise, the Korean Hawaii, I guess you could say, is in that mission. There's missionaries on that island. Yeah, there's just a lot of Korean history there. Some of the biggest Buddhist temples are there. Those are beautiful structures, really rich in history. Um, the Pusan perimeter during the Korean War was established in our mission. So you see a lot of really old buildings, a lot of really old people there as well, because um, during the Korean War, that was really the only place that wasn't um, decimated. So there's rich modern history there. Church-wise, the people are so faithful. There's some really, really amazing people. There's been some really hard things in church history um, in the Pusan area. But the people that have remained active and the people that are leading the church there now are some of the most faithful, some of the most wonderful people um, that I think you could meet anywhere. The stories of faith that come out of there are just unbelievable, almost. They're <laughs> you just, you know, one of the greatest blessings was just talking to the older people that lived there, even the church members, non-church members, and just talking to them about what they've experienced. And um, it's unbelievable. Some of the stories of faith, the things that they've had to overcome as a nation, the things they've had to overcome as a church there. And the missionary work isn't slow in Busan. It's, uh, it's vibrant. There's lots of different aspects. You get a lot of
proselyting work there. You get a lot of teaching and baptizing. Um, you also have a lot of reactivation, which is some of the sweetest work. You have a lot of finding um, less active recent converts and bringing them back. They, a lot of them want to be back, and you just have to fish them out of the world, which is what you have to do everywhere. But um, it's extremely rewarding. They're such a loving people. Um, Pusan is known for its dialect, which is kind of crazy. It's super cool. It's not um, super difficult to understand once you kind of get the hang of the language in the first place, but it adds um, a whole other dimension. There's a lot of different dialects in Tegu, Pusan, um, kind of out more east, like near the Tejan Pusan border. Um, some crazy dialects down on Tejido, almost a completely different language. The older people speak that, it's, it's crazy, but yeah. And then the, the food there is kind of different. It's um, a lot more seafood. I guess Korean food in general is a lot of seafood, but Busan um, is known for its seafood especially. A lot of a lot of raw fish, which is really, really good. A lot of um, different kind of cooked fish. Um, squid, octopus, sea squirts, I guess is what they're called in English. Um, just a lot of different interesting food. Oysters. It's famous down um, in Tongyang for their oysters. Just super, super diverse um, culturally, I guess. Maybe not diverse isn't the right word because it's pretty solidly Korean, but um, I guess you could say rich, culturally rich. It's so different from American culture and European, Australian culture, it's so different, but um, they really, they're so loving. They go out of the way to help you. You know, we were on a bus, um, several times and we didn't know where to get off. We were looking for an address and we didn't really know where we were because it was in a different part of the city that we had never been to. And I just asked the guy next to me, I was like, Hey, do you know where this place is? And you know, everybody around you knows that you're a foreigner speaking Korean. And so heads snap around and look at you. And then everybody like wants to jump in and help. We had literally the entire bus, like get out of their seats and try to find this place and where it was on like the bus map. We had people get off the bus at the stop and like walk us to the place we needed to go. Um, turned out not to be the place that we needed to go. So they're like, well, I don't know where it is. Let's go ask this guy. So, you know, like these random uh, people that we had no we had no idea who they were, they didn't know who we are, but they got off the bus with us, took us to a place, took us to another place, asked questions for us, and then those people, you know, they were working at, um, I think it was a fish store or something, but they took us the rest of the way to the place where we needed to go, um, and that was like super common. It's a really Buddhist place, some of the biggest temples are in Busan. So from my experience, inside of the people that say they're Buddhist, there's a huge range of what they believe and what they practice. So, you know, if you ask somebody what religion they are and they say Buddhist, that doesn't tell you a whole lot because they, could, they may still believe in Jesus Christ. They may um, not believe in a God at all, or they may believe in lots of gods. They may believe in one God. Um, so there's lots of different types of Buddhism. There's a lot of different Christianities, I guess, forms of Christianity um, there. Chris, um, you'll see a lot of churches. There's a lot of people that say they're Mugyo, which um, I guess translates to atheist, but more like agnostic, I think would be a more appropriate way to kind of define that. Maybe they don't believe that there is no God, but they just don't believe kind of that there is a God or they don't know him. Um, I think Doctrine and Covenants explains it really well. It says there's lots of people kept from the truth because they know not where to find it. And that's kind of it. They're like looking for it. They look for it in a lot of different ways. Building common ground, like you said, that is so important because there's so much that we do have in common. Um, people are fundamentally good, especially Koreans are fundamentally nice people. Um, they believe that doing, you know, that doing good is the right thing to do and that you should do good regardless. You know, the Lord's church isn't like a church of boundaries necessarily. I think since every one of them, every one of us is a child of God, we all retain kind of fundamental beliefs. So some of those beliefs were that 
that people are fundamentally good, that we need to look beyond ourselves. Um, family is really important. So that's a huge point of common ground. Um, love and faithfulness inside a family. The fact that you should live, you know, kind of in a disciplined way um, with respect for other people. That's a huge thing. So um, what that would look like is you can't just go to somebody and kind of disrespect their beliefs because, you know, in a general sense, it's hard to talk about common ground, but, you know, any given person that you talk to, there's, you know, acres and acres of common ground between you. And there's so much love that you can share by finding that common ground. Um, people are so interesting. You can just learn so much by uh, figuring out things that are similar. And the nice thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that it does apply to every aspect of life. And so as long as you're aware of the gospel of Jesus Christ and it's an integral part of everything you do, you'll be able to find how it relates to anything that somebody says to you. And so, yeah, it's really easy. Just find out about other people. That's, I mean, thinking about what I would do if I could go back, it would be to go back and um, just talk to people, find out about them and how the, gospel, how the Lord has prepared them to receive the gospel. Because um, they say the devil's in the details, but I think the Lord is in the details more. And the details of, I know he's in the details of my life, and he's in the details of every single person that I met. He's in the details of their lives. And you just got to find it. And when you do, it's really beautiful. It's like a treasure hunt, yeah. basically. My first area was Satsan in uh, Kyungsan Namdo, right on the south, kind of, what is that, southwest corner of the mission. So Satsan, and then in Kumjang, which is inside of Pusan, it's the northernmost area in the city of Pusan. <clears throat> then Sujang, which is the steak center for the Pusan steak. Then I went to Hoge, which is in Ulsan, which is um, kind of farther north, right on the sea again. And then went to, yeah, from Ulsan I went to Chine, which is in Changwon city. I was only there for a, uh, a transfer. But that's where like the, um, it's like a, it's famous in Korea. I think it's famous worldwide because a lot of foreigners were there. The uh, Cherry Blossom Festival. It's only a week long, but it's like the biggest in Korea. So Chine, and then I went to, my last area was Gumi which is um, really kind of far north in the Pusan area, right next to the Taejeon mission. First off, I guess, like the demographic, there's a lot of older people, and that is so cool. They have, I mean, they went through the Korean War, they went through the Depression, it was basically like a third world country after that, and it's risen to like a super strong economy, first world country, definitely. So, you know, the older people have lived through that, the, um, like the middle-aged people pushed that. They pushed it from a third world country to a first world country. Um, so, for example, the people, like the workers there, they're going to be really busy. I mean, some of them work like seven days a week. Some of them work six days a week, you know, 80 hour work week. Some of them work less, obviously, but um, just really hard workers because they were the foundation of that economy that blew up, basically. Um, Something unique about Busan is that there's really, really old buildings. Like, it's a really, really old city juxtaposed against a really, really new and progressing city. So, you know, a lot of the build there's so much construction going on all the time. There's, like, brand new buildings right up against buildings that are probably, like, 80, 90 years old. So, you'll see people living in, like, the roughest of housing right next to apartment buildings that are, like, you know, 60 floors tall and just like really, really nice. Um, so that's something interesting, uh, just cause there's like super old part, super new part, and they just kind of like meshed. Um, it's, I think land wise, it's not super big, um, because like the Korean peninsula is really only about as big as Florida. And so the city of Busan isn't all that big, but it is super tall, like buildings on top of buildings on top of buildings. It just like rises up. I remember I got transferred there in the winter and I didn't see grass at all until like a month before I left inside the city, just cause it's straight concrete. 
Um, and that's kind of cool. There's cool things about that. But the other thing is that the mountains are protected land in Korea, and it's really, really mountainous in Busan. So we lived, my second area in Busan, we lived like at the foot of a little mountain. And they can't chop down trees, so they can't expand into the mountains. And so it'll be like, you know, the modernest of city mixed with like the oldest of city and then just like green forest, right? Smack dab in the middle of it. And that's kind of cool because you can like take one step and you're in like a bustling metropolitan city and then you take like another step and you're in a forest. So that's kind of cool that I don't know if it's like that in any other place. Rice is actually really expensive, <laughs> and so is kimchi. So the members give that to you most of the time, which is really nice. The members take care of you. You don't have a lot of member appointments, so you do have to get used to buying food and making food. They don't have a whole lot of American food for you to make, so you do get pretty good at Korean cooking inside of the city of Busan, especially. The monetary system, it's one just like everywhere else in Korea, but um, yeah, you do have to get used to living on the economy because you are going to be taking care of yourself food-wise a lot of the time. The missionaries don't worry about the apartment. The office takes care of that. The apartments are nice. There's not any washing machine, or there's washing machines. There's no dryers. There's no dishwashers. But um, it's about a thousand won to a dollar, and you can live well. We lived well on like. $300 a month for everything that includes, you know, we cooked for ourselves three meals a day um, most of the time traveling the subways the buses and taxis taxis are the most expensive the um, The buses are generally a dollar ten for Admission to get on a bus, but you can take it wherever um, Inside of the city of Busan you can transfer from bus to bus. I think it's like twice um, without having to repay. They have like little um, travel cards that you use. Those same cards get you on the subway. The subway again is I think a dollar ten or maybe like 90 cents. 901. Yeah, a thousand hundred one. Um, so it's not super expensive to travel around especially because it'll take you really anywhere you need to go in the city. The buses are super great. The subways are super great. The taxi men are awesome. Crime, it's hilarious. You'll go into the um, the subway system and they have like Korea's most wanted 25 most wanted people um, You know the first 10 are like murder, but the rest of them are tax evasion Basically super safe you, like yeah, really really safe. I think somebody got robbed maybe like a Hundred years ago and then that ended but um no like yeah only one missionary ever got robbed I think or maybe twice in the whole two years I was there but that was super rare and they were like deep inner city. So not a big deal. Um, it's really safe. The people are nice. The food, yeah, so that is actually something special to Korea. Some of the things to see are like the fish markets there because um, like Jagarti, for instance, is um, famous in Korea. It's just like endless fish market in like the southernmost part of the Pusan city. Um, shopping is really good there. You can get basically anything you want. Um, ties are like a dollar, two dollars in a lot of places. So don't buy ties before you go to Korea. Or suits because those are super cheap as well. I think I got a suit for like um, sixty dollars, and then I got another one, like a nice one, for one hundred and ten dollars, and it's still lasting me really well. So that's nice. Um, the food, yeah, it's really fish centric and really easy to get around. Really easy to eat there but the food is really different in Busan inside of Korea. Korea is probably the most technologically advanced place I think you could be. Um, everybody has a smartphone, the latest smartphone. Whether or not that's a good thing is up to other people, but everybody has one. Cool things to see, Bomosa is a Korean temple. It's, uh, it's on a mountain, but it's still like basically in the city. It was, um, my second area was, like a five minute bus ride from it. Um, it's one of the biggest temples in Korea. And then there's like three sacred artifacts to Buddhism in Korea. And one of, and they're each in like a huge temple. And one of those temples is inside the, it's not in the city of Pusan, it's in Yangsan, but it's right above Pusan. And that's like an hour and a half bus ride 
um, from that area. That's really cool to see. There's another um, uh, in the Pusan mission, not necessarily in the city of Pusan, but the Shila dynasty, which was like the longest and most powerful Korean dynasty. The capital isn't Seoul, it's um, Gyeongju, which is also in the Pusan mission. So that's just like chock full of all kind of history. Um, huge tombs that are like big mounds. They're not as big as the pyramids, I guess, but they're like really big uh, burial mounds. Those are super cool to see. There's like a fortress there that's really cool to see. Uh, one of the um, best preserved, most famous temples, Buddhist temples, is in Gyeongju. The city itself is just really old and really beautiful. You can take bike tours of that. Uh, we did that for a young men's activity one time. Um, inside of Busan, yeah, there's yeah the Buddhist temple there that's really pretty. There's just there's a lot to see. It's just like, you know, I guess I've been to New York City and it's comparable to that, but like more jam-packed and like more historical, if you could imagine that. All Four Seasons, definitely All Four Seasons, very, very hot and humid in the summer. Um, it's kind of nice being in Pusan because you have the sea breeze to kind of cool you off if you're kind of on the, um, the ed on the coast. Um, really, really cold in the winter and it doesn't snow a whole lot typically, so it's just really, really miserably biting cold <laughs> wind, a lot of wind. Um, not as bad as Siberia probably, but it's cold. But really, really pretty turning of the seasons, definitely distinct four seasons, really pretty. There's a monsoon season that's kind of interesting um, during, what is that? That's kind of like July, August time frame, I guess and a lot, a lot of rain, a lot of wind, umbrellas don't really work. The second and third areas were inside the city of Pusan, and that's really busy city life. You're gonna get citygoers really just super busy. But there are countryside um, areas, my first area, Sachan, and my last area, Gumi, were really countryside. And the city itself, like of Sachan or Gumi, is you know bigger more compact than anything you'd get in America really but right outside of that is just like rice fields and um, orchards and the people that work there are farmers and just like older people generally and so it's a lot slower way of life they're just really um, just really pleasant really slow going really easy going really nice people um, the food is completely different you're gonna get really traditional food and so it's going to be very very different from first of all western food and second of all even like inner city food the country food is um, a lot more fishy a lot more vegetable-y just a lot different Sachin itself is really pretty um, it's right on the coast there's a bigger island that it connects to called Namhe and um, transportation is a little bit different because you're way out in the country. We had to hitchhike a few times. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it worked. We contacted some really cool people. Was, again, Korea is really safe, but we hitchhiked there because there wasn't really another way to get to where we needed to go. There's like a big German village on that island, um, so that's kind of cool. Just a lot of fields, a lot of like um, seafront property. It's just like really mountainous and the mountains just kind of like run right into the sea so there's like a lot of little islands it's super pretty um, right in that area as well as Tongyang and there's like famous pearl divers famous oysters come out of Tongyang um, also right there is not like right next to it but Changwon is another city that's really close to that and famous again for its cherry blossoms there's a couple of navy bases in that area but mainly you can go and like in the city areas, so like Miryang, Sachan, um, Andong especially is more landlocked, but it's up there. Gumi, uh, those places you can lo you can walk sometimes for hours in certain places and see nobody because um, there's just it's just fields, or you can even be in the city and everybody's like gone to other cities to work. So it'll be like that, but then during the big holidays, it's like, I, I believe it's more populous than Seoul sometimes during the 
holidays because everybody goes to their grandparents' house for the holidays, like um, Chusak or uh, Solar, like the Lunar New Year and the Thanksgiving. So during those days, it'll be just like jam-packed busy, but on every other day of the year, it'll be like empty as empty gets. But the people that you do find are a lot more easygoing, a lot slower going, and um, they don't speak as um, they don't speak English as well generally. And the more the farther from Seoul you get, I feel like, um, and the farther from the big cities you get, uh, the less they speak English. So we went to that island, and we were walking by a preschool, going to our branch president's house, and all the Korean kids just like swarmed to the fence because they had never seen a white person before. And my companion and I were white, we spoke Korean, and they had never conceived that a foreigner could speak Korean, and it just like shocked them to death. They like started screaming and ran back into the, uh, the preschool. But it was great, like, yeah, it's like being a celebrity sometimes in the, like, the uh, more countryside areas, because they just don't see a lot of foreigners, and certainly the foreigners there don't speak Korean, so um, you definitely get a celebrity factor in the, um, we called it Weigugin power, but it's celebrity factor basically in like the more countryside areas and especially in Busan because it's really far from Seoul so there's not as many foreigners. The view that the West has of North Korea is very very different from the view that the South Koreans have of North Korea and I'm not South Korean so I won't um, like kind of I guess say what they think about it but kind of the feeling of a Westerner living in South Korea about North Korea um, was that they're not trying to take North Korea, they're not trying to hurt the North Koreans, it's not like a war kind of thing, you know, it's more of a reunification thing. They, that's, every time North Korea comes up, it's all about reunification, you know, because it was just kind of an arbitrary line drawn in the sand, and then, okay, up north is North Korea, down south is South Korea, and so there's families that are split, um, and yeah, there's lots of relatives in North Korea that the South Koreans want to see again. They wouldn't want them hurt. I met a few North Koreans that had escaped and come down south. Um, they liked living there. It was a little bit different, obviously. But it's not... And I was there during a summer that apparently there was like a lot of um, attention on North Korea. They were doing some things that I guess the U.S. wasn't super fond of. But I didn't hear about any of it, even from the South Koreans. Like... I guess the way a South Korean um, kind of characterized it was this way that um, North Korea is kind of an unruly dog on a chain. Some people may want to punish the dog, but a lot of the South Koreans just kind of say, oh, it'll just bark, just leave it alone. Um, so yeah, there's not a whole lot of animosity from the South Koreans towards the North Koreans, and there's not a whole lot of um, worry that North Korea is going to um, hurt them, really from the feeling that I got. I also served with an elder who was a soldier um, and had, you know, friends die when North Korea um, sent a rocket over one time. But even then, there wasn't a whole lot of hatred for North Korean people. So, yeah, there's definitely a distinction between the North Korean government and the North Korean people, um, even ideologically, kind of from the Western's perspective, having learned about it, um, you know, through classes. So, yeah, not a whole lot of things to worry about, I guess, especially if you're serving in Busan, because that's where everybody would evacuate to. So it's super safe. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a lot to worry about from North Korea while you're there. So that's um, a pretty hot topic in South Korea. It's kind of controversial, so I won't go into that, really. But um, the guy that I met, he was just kind of like sitting on the, uh, the side of the road when we found him. Um, he didn't know Korean. He couldn't read or write um, when he got there a year ago, so he was learning that slowly. Korean is based on, um, I guess you could say, Chinese characters, and he and that's kind of a common thing for Koreans to know. To like, if you say a word that they don't know, like a gospel word they don't know, you can use like the Chinese to tell them what it means, and they'll get it um, typically. And he didn't even like. Um, for example, God Shin is just kind of like the generic word for God there. So like Buddhist gods, our God, kind of whatever. And he didn't know what that meant even. And he didn't even kind of get the whole idea of a God. 
So that was really new to me because he didn't even, he didn't know what our God meant, first of all, but he didn't know the idea of a creator. So that was super interesting. Um, and I wouldn't generalize that, but he was from North Korea and he had no concept of a God. That was interesting. He was really slow going, easy going, because a lot of it is farming, I guess, up in North Korea. There's not as much, like, obviously the economy is not as robust as South Korea. And so it's hard for them a lot of the time to come to South Korea and just kind of jump into the work life. Um, so that was really hard for him. He was kind of an older guy and South Korean life just kind of really passed him by and he didn't have a whole lot of interest in, you know, technology and the TV shows and dramas, that kind of thing. He was just really happy that nobody was telling him what to do and he wasn't afraid of dying. So um, that was really interesting. He just had a really different perspective on life. There was no view of God from him, but there was also no like worldly, you know, like screen in front of his eyes kind of thing. Now, this guy, he walked with a limp and he had like a crutch kind of thing. And we asked him what happened. And he said he was, while well, he was a boy in North Korea, they were playing with an unexploded ordinance, like a, like a grenade or a bomb shell kind of thing. And he threw it and it blew up and shrapnel got in his leg. So he had trouble walking the rest of his life. That was kind of weird. I didn't realize that there, he, yeah, it was just kind of weird for me that like as a kid, they were just like tossing around bombshells and it blew up and hurt him. So I remember there were North Korean um, like food places. I don't remember if we went to any of them, but I do remember hearing that they were like really different. It was just kind of, yeah, as small as Korea is, there's incredible diversity in the food, the language, the culture. Yeah, even like in America, you get married in a church, you like involve God in the marriage. Um, like a traditional thing for them is to go to like this huge statue of Kim, Kim Il-sung, their like first North Korean leader, and to bow to that and like pay homage to him. So that was like really interesting to learn. I didn't know that while I was in Korea, but um, came back, took a class on North Korea, and that was, yeah. So it's just like God is completely out of the, um, their life and their leader kind of fills that void. So it's really interesting. interesting. Even titles ascribed to him become like dedicated to him. You can't use them for anybody else. Like we, you know, the president, for example, the word president applies to any of our presidents. Um, their first leader has a certain title and then that like title was retired when he died. And so the next guy got a different title, was a little bit bigger. Um, he would say things and that would get attributed to him and then it was like his words and then when he died that was retired The next one got another set of things and like yeah, so it's really interesting the word for young women is a, uh, Is very very similar to another word used in the Bible um, talking about women of not so high report and That is a very very close word and my companion we went in there was a um, there's a stake young women's meeting going on at our church the day that he got uh, to the area. So he came in and the, the young women all knew who he was, said hi. We did something, they had all left and we came back and our uh, Relief Society president, president was there and he asked where all the young women had gone but swapped the words and it was super embarrassing for him. He didn't know like what he had said but the Relief Society president kind of had a stunned look on her face. And I was like, oh, he didn't mean to say that. It was young women that he meant to say. So <laughs> that was probably the worst that we did. But um, the word for God is really close to Hamanim, which um, is basically like saying Mr. Hippo. Um, the word for us is very close to duck. And uh, what's the other one that everybody messes up? So a lot of the time you'll hear people say like, Mr. Hippo loves the ducks very much instead of God loves us very much. So that's a common one that you hear a lot. Okay, so I'll say um, I'm a missionary from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My message is simple. That's something we learned at the MTC pretty early on. This is embarrassing. This is what I sounded like. That's why it's embarrassing. Jonan Sangyosa Imnida. Yesu Karisido Hugisungdo Kyohe Eso Wasunida Yeah J Message Aju Kante and Hamnida. 
Okay, so that's the bad Korean, right? Don't do that ever. It's terrible, sounds bad. Um, this will still be, you know, a foreigner's accent, but I think it's a little bit better by now, hopefully. Uh, um, so that's the phrase. So the first thing is that the vowels are always the same in Korean. They don't change like our vowels. Um, so ahs are always ah, ah, ah. Um, 선교사, 입니다, those are always ahs. The e's are always e's, and they're not e. Like, um, 저는 하고 싶습니다. Would be like I want to or something. Um, shipsumnida is how you'd say it, not shipsumnida. Shipsumnida, that's it's yeah, it just sounds terrible. Don't say it. Shipsumnida, yeah, um, is the right way. Yeah, the vowels are always the same, they never change, which is something that we slip into, Americans always slip into. Uh, uh is a vowel, and that's just a hard one for Americans to do. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to mess that one up, <laughs> but it's like, uh, like somebody's hit you in the stomach, like, uh. So the consonants, there's like normal consonants, aspirated consonants, and then double consonants. So like ga, ka is a regular consonant, ka is an aspirated, then ga, ga is the double consonant. And so it's kind of like saying it with your mouth is the ga, the regular one, like kind of spitting it out, ka. Because there's a, you can feel it, ka, there's a lot of air coming out. And then ka is, um, I guess they say it's like a glottal sound, like a guttural sound, but it's like, you can feel it kind of like getting stuck in your throat. Um, so those are important. And yeah, it's really simple, but you got to practice. So. so just some really basic things. Korean is a hard language, but it is a really, really simple language. I think the, the only thing that makes it difficult for Westerners is, first of all, like the characters. You have to learn the characters. And then the expression and the way they speak is different from the way that we would express things. And so the alphabet is really, really easy, really simple. You can learn it in like an hour of dedicated study. And then like, you know, 10 minutes. Yeah, so just like take an hour when you get your mission call and learn the characters with like your dad or something or your mom learn the characters and then for like 10 minutes a day after that you know do your scripture study and then just review the characters and then after like you know two or three weeks of that you'll be able to read you won't understand what you're reading you but you'll be able to read and then just practice reading like you know 10 15 minutes a day read your scriptures in korean you can find it online at lds.org and if you do that, you'll be so far ahead. And then the other thing, so the, the alphabet is really important to get. Understand how, it, how syllables are made and just like how to read it. It'll be really easy if you just dedicate some time to it. And then the second thing is the, um, like the sentence structure throws a lot of people. But it's just like subject, object, verb. And oh, that's another thing. Just like learn kind of like, I guess, English grammar and you'll be a lot better off trying to learn Korean grammar. But you go subject, object, verb, and they mark everything with like little particles, like little markers. Um, and so it's really easy to find like the sentence structure, but it's just subject, object, verb, basically. And it just follows that. So, you know, I kicked the chair, for instance, in English is subject, verb, object. In Korean, it would be I, the chair kicked. Um, and so that's a little bit different, but it's really easy. It's always that way. There's not a lot of exceptions in Korean. So learn the alphabet, and it's really simple. Just dedicate some time to it. And then learn the grammar structure and realize that there aren't very many exceptions in Korean. And um, once you practice that, like... Don't learn it from dramas because they'll teach you words and forms that you're never going to use as a missionary because you're not in a drama. <laughs> but take some time and actually like dedicate yourself to learning the grammar and the alphabet and you'll be so far ahead. Learning it will really only be like learning the Korean tongue and the way they express things instead of worrying about the language and like the mechanics of it. Missionaries with faith will accomplish great things. Um, 
Korea is not a land dead to missionary work. It's not a land um, dead to any kind of God's influence. Missionaries with faith will accomplish amazing things that nobody thought possible. It's been done in Korea before. There's been um, miracles wrought by faith. There's been miracles wrought by missionaries with faith over decades, and there will be um, wrought for decades. The Lord has great miracles intended for the people in Busan, South Korea, uh, but he needs his personal representatives to have the faith that he would have if he were here. Mm. But if they have that faith, he will do incredible, incredible things in the lives of the missionaries and in the lives of the people that they're serving. I got the Korean language book before I got to the MTC, and had I studied that a lot before I got to the MTC, it would have been a lot better. Um, I had the opportunity. Korean is a really easy language to learn the alphabet for. Um, it's really easy to practice, even with somebody that doesn't know the language. I mean, you can't really learn the words or anything, but you can read it, and that is such a help going into Korea and going into the MTC. And I had the opportunity to do it, but I didn't do it as well as I should have. So, you know, it's just, it's just something super easy to do. So if you get a call to Korea, like, the one of the first things you should do is just, like, learn the alphabet. Because it's, again, it's really easy. It's really helpful. But other than that, I think reading Preach My Gospel. Because, I mean, I've, I was born into the church, but it was still kind of new to me that I guess the gospel of Jesus Christ could be defined as faith, repentance, baptism, and uh, the gift of the Holy Ghost and enduring to the end. Because I hadn't looked through Preach My Gospel as well as I should have. So, yeah, I guess the first thing that I would have redone had I got my call was like actually read all of Preach My Gospel and try to understand it. And then, yeah, just learn the language better because it's, it's really easy to pick up before going to the MTC. Through my experience in Korea, I know that God does live, that he does actually exist, uh, and that he's very, very involved in our lives, our personal lives. He's involved in my life, um, and he's involved in your life. He called you to Korea and to Busan um, for certain reasons, and you'll learn a lot why. But more than anything, uh, Jesus Christ is a real person. Mm. He's your friend, but he's also your God. And he has more power than any amount of money, any government, any combination of situations, any health issue. He's more powerful, and he's in charge. Ultimately, he knows what's best, and uh, if you're obedient to him, he'll do what's best, and you'll do what's best. I just really know that faith in Christ is the most powerful thing, the, power, the most powerful force in this world. And repentance is the best ever. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.